So I'm speaking today with Ken Gloss, a frequent guest appraiser on PBS's Antiques Roadshow and the proprietor of the internationally known Brattle Bookshop uh, in Boston's downtown crossing. Uh, Ken and I are going to talk about a program that's happening here on Zoom on the library on Tuesday, November 10th, starting at 7 o'clock. It is the Rare Books Antiques Roadshow. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Ken, thanks so much for joining me and talking to me uh, today and for coming into the library uh, virtually to do this program. Uh, you've been steeped in books uh, for quite a while. You've been running the Brattle Bookstore since, well, I think I saw you took it full time in 1985. Is that right? Well, a, a little before. I grew up with it. I mean, it was my family store. So yeah. my parents actually say my first word was book. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure they were talking about it, but, but it's been in my family since 1949. Wow. Uh, okay. And then I went to college. I have a degree in chemistry from UMass Amherst. Mm -hmm. In 1973, I was going to go to Wisconsin to get a doctorate, but I decided to take a year off. My father's health wasn't that good. So I've actually been working at the store full time since 1973, a few wow. years. My father died in 1985, and that's when I really took over. Basically, I've done this all my life. And uh, a lot of what I've, uh, all, all my life, books have been here and there, piled up, uh, rare ones, one, ones to read. And, uh, and it's a lot of fun. It's the treasure hunt every day, never knowing who you're going to see, what you're going to meet, the people, places. So do you get to use that chemistry degree much? Do you find yourself like thinking about the, you know, the you know, lamenting people who haven't paid attention to the proper surroundings and have books moldy in basements and that kind of thing, or? No, uh, <laughs> no. Uh, what, what was most valuable, and maybe people who work in a family business will understand this more than others, is the hardest part about coming to work at the bookstore. I always loved working, was working for my father and with my father. There, any small, so the big advantage of the chemistry was when I came to start at the store, I knew I could do something else, and my father knew I could do something else, <laughs> and that actually helped pave the way. At the beginning, I used to get fired at least three, four, five times a week, uh, <laughs> but I wouldn't get that worried about it. And then after the first year or two, we both learned how to work with each other to a degree, yeah. and so the chemistry was very valuable in the fact that I came in and I knew that I had an option, but I'm so happy that I'm not in a laboratory. This is a whole lot more fun. I bet. How, so you started with it working with your father. Do you have other family members working with you still? Or are you the only? Uh, my wife. My wife works at the shop. Uh, she's been for years. I've been doing this, and she does a lot of the behind the scenes. Uh, keeps the store running. Okay. You know, everybody sort of looks at me, and I'm doing this and that and but without her it would all sort of fall apart behind me mm -hmm. so she, she does it and uh and then we have about six seven other employees i have two daughters who are in their 30s maybe someday but one of them lives in nairobi it's a mm -hmm. long commute and the other one That's easier by zoom but still you know. easier by, and the other one uh, has a four-month-old baby but we'll see we'll see what okay. happens Maybe the four-month-old will uh, it will come around at some point, and uh, uh, you know we're already training. Yeah, and then and you, it's never too early to start with board books and 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 start reading on the lap. So uh. one of, one of the great joys when my daughters were younger, and I'm hoping with my grandson, it was reading to them. Oh, and sure. uh, I actually read to the older daughter until she was twelve or thirteen, till finally we were a little too old for her, but. That was one of my great joys, and both of them like books and reading, and maybe that was part of it. There's something to be said for, you know, I know adults who enjoy listening. You know, sometimes when we listen to talk radio or you listen to NPR, you get a good story. It's that same joy of, of having somebody read to you and just getting information that way. It's, it's intimate. It uh, can be very comforting. Yeah, there's, there's definitely a great, you know, shared bond there. So, well, one, one, of, one of the times a colleague of mine was asked one time what his favorite book was. Mm -hmm. and, and I, you know, I was waiting. That for is his, really tough. That's a really, really hard question. Jeez. Well, he said the ones that he read to his son when they were, when he was little. That's and a good answer. I actually, I picked right up on that because every Christmas Eve to one of my daughters in particular, I read the night before Christmas, but we read mm -hmm. it 
on the same the same book. So we the still same have that book. Yeah. And matter of fact, when she got married and was in Texas one time, uh, it was before Zoom, but she had me recorded on YouTube. Yes. And then she could, Christmas Eve, she played it. So that's one of my most important books. When I do the talks at, at the libraries, either when I'm doing them live or on Zoom, is I try to tell stories. I try to make books interesting. I could try to teach people about books, and I'll guarantee you I could put everybody asleep in five minutes. <laughs> but, if, but if you tell stories about the books, about the places, about the people, most people who have books are interesting. They might, you might like the way they're interesting. You might not like, but th there's something to it. And in the books that you see, you never know what it's going to be. I was just um, looking at a catalog, and one of my other favorite books that I didn't read to my daughters was uh, called The Last Men of the Revolution. Now, hmm. it's, it's worth a, a bit, but what it is, it was in 1863, it was photographs of people who fought in the Revolutionary War. Oh, wow. So, I mean, you're actually looking at, now, they're all in their hundreds, but you're actually looking at actual photographs of men who fought in the revolution. Yeah. And just who were alive like in the 1860s. That's incredible. Yeah, who were alive. Yeah. But it was just, well, part of it, it was a promotional to try to, you know, the union, the Civil War was going on sure, to yeah. promote patriotism of the union. But to sort of look at that, it, it brings so much together for me. But that's what I like. It's fun. And, and you that never know what someone else is going to like. Uh, Ken, how do you feel about sometimes, you know, I'm in a, in a store like yours and I find a book that somebody has, you know, you know, taken care to write to somebody inside with a personal note when they've signed, you know, as a gift. But then whoever was, you know, who was given the gift either didn't see or just didn't sign it. It was not important enough to keep in their personal collection. Have you come across anything like that that like added value? Sometimes it just kind of breaks my heart a little bit that here's a gift that wasn't appreciated, even though I know I shouldn't take it that way. <laughs> well, there are a few great stories about that. But uh, no, actually, there are people who sometimes like collecting books like that mm -hmm. from the 19th century. You know, at Christmas time, Aunt right. um, Gertrude gave this to, and the handwriting is beautiful. And so some people collect it that way. But mm -hmm. there's a great story. There was once a... Uh, a man named Somerset Maugham, who was a famous writer, he went into a store in Paris and he saw one of his books and said, uh, and he pulled it out and looked at it and it was inscribed by him to somebody else. And so he took the book, he re-inscribed it, he said, I know somebody must have stolen this or not returned it when they borrowed it from you. <laughs> then he sent it back to him. <laughs> Reinscribed, you know, sort of saying, "Hey, it's like, the, it's like the cat that came back. You couldn't give the book away." <laughs> well, and and then a second story was, uh, we one time bought a library of a college president, mm -hmm. and there was a lot of books in there, and and um, and there was one of them uh, that was inscribed to uh, him by his mother uh, from saying, and um, and there was the book and, and we sent it back to him. He goes, my mother, I had so much problems with my mother. And she used to say, you're never going to succeed or be anything. And he said, I was purposely getting rid of that book because it reminded me of my mother. And here we were sending it back to him. Again, you never know. And sometimes that inscription though, obviously if it's something very rare and valuable, uh, we one time had a copy of The Great Gatsby, which is a classic, it, it right. wasn't, but it was inscribed to the greatest living poet, T.S. Eliot, sincerely F. Scott Fitzgerald. And then T.S. Eliot annotated the whole book. Oh, wow. Now, yeah. normally if someone's underlined and annotated and made comments, yeah, that's not so good. But when it's T.S. Eliot, T.S. Eliot does it, yeah. Scott Fitzgerald. So it all depends who, what, how it's done. Um, and sometimes when you get to really ancient books, going back into the 14, 1500s, mm. just the comments by what people put in the margins to a scholar can be as interesting sometimes as what the book is. So, sure. it, it, yes, it, and then there are times you look at it and someone's put it across the title page in big magic marker, happy birthday, and no, that doesn't help. <laughs> that, that doesn't add, no. <laughs> One of the things when I was doing talks live, 
people at the end would bring books in and we do the appraisals. It's a lot harder to do, although I'm sure there'll be a question and answer period at the end. Absolutely. If somebody wants to hold up a book, I can try, but people are also very welcome to send pictures or call and we can do a lot of appraisals either by phone or, or image or whatever. Uh, I'm still happy to do it and give a quick verbals. And most of the time at the talks, people would think, gee, you bring in a book and they hear me person after person saying, yeah, that's nice, sentimentally valuable, not, that's nice. Once in a great, great while, something valuable comes in. But the people who many times you tell that isn't valuable, they go, great, they're thrilled, they're happy. I don't have to worry about it anymore. <laughs> I can give it to my grandchildren. I can sell it. I don't have to worry about it. And you, you no longer have responsibility for this object. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. And so you'd think when you tell them that eh, it's not that valuable, they'd be disappointed. More often than not, they're absolutely so I can read it now. <laughs> <laughs> I just need more space on my shelves. I can like get rid of it and my conscience is free. <laughs> well, that's, that's, a, that's another whole thing that uh, we, uh, one time uh, we had a customer who worked in public relations and booksellers were trying to sell more books. Right. And one of the ways he promoted it is he went to architects and said, a house has more prestige if it has a library and bookshelves. And of course, if you have bookshelves, you have to buy books. But right. then the second problem was, once the bookshelves got filled up, people stopped. So he was one of the ones that first encouraged like Morgan Memorial and Goodwill to have book departments so people could give them away For so the they could buy more new ones. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, but uh, many times we go into houses and people have very neat th shelves. Other times, it's literally you almost have to climb over or step over. Uh, the bathtub's full, the, right. the, the rooms. And, and, but sometimes the, those are the best books, sometimes not so great. Uh, we, have one, we have one customer who won't allow workmen in his house, even though it needs a lot of work, because he's afraid that if they go in, that they'll end up calling an inspector because the place... It's so full of order. Of yeah. So <laughs> I do encourage people to keep those that they find most, you know, that, that, that's good to have on hand. You know, I know some people who, you know, can't imagine getting rid of a book. And I think, you know, I've certainly seen shelves where the, you know, the amount of books that, that anybody's going to actually pay attention to are crowding out uh, the, you know, are, are the, the ones that people who are paying attention are being crowded out by a whole bunch of stuff that people just are, are not, you know, are just not of high value. And so it's important to figure out what, what is of value to you. And that's different for each of us. Um, but helping people let go, I think, is really, you know, I have tons of, you know, as you can see, I mean, I've got tons of books here. I got overflow from my house, I think, behind me. Um, <laughs> because there were certain, but, oh, that's a professional collection. I got to bring it in. Um, if you have space, it gets filled. Yeah, it, it can. It certainly can. A lot of times, from my point of view, we go into houses where people either are passed on or they're moving. And it's interesting, you look quickly at their books and bookshelves, you can tell their politics many times. Oh, I'm sure. You can yeah. tell whether they're really scholars or whether the books were more for show. Right. You can tell what their interests were, uh, what maybe profession they were in. The, the books actually reveal and tell a lot about who they were and, and what their ideas and thoughts were. Some of them you'd say, gee, I would have loved to have met that person, and others, Maybe not so much. Hmm. Not so bad that we didn't cross paths. Yeah. Exactly. Well, so many of us, I think, keep books on our shelves because they bring us comfort, just knowing that we're in the company. Um, and, you know, the best shelves, are, for me at least, are those that are a mix of things that I've really enjoyed and the aspirational, the stuff that I really want to get to when I can find the time. When I was growing up, my father used to bring home four or five books a day. Do that for 30 or 40 years, and you can imagine oh. what the house looks like. Whereas I tend to more, I read books, I bring them back, I, I get into a subject of books, about books, of history, but then there, are, then there are certain ones that I know, oh, this leads to that, and that leads to this, and uh, it, it's, you know, so there are different reasons, and then mm -hmm. there's only so much space. Yeah, there's only, and there's always, there's never enough time, there's way more out there than where any of us are ever going to have time to read, so we have to balance how much space we have and how much time we think we're going to have 
and not get totally overwhelmed. It's like one day I might be going to someone's collection that has, you know, books on railroads. Another time they might have been a nuclear physicist. No. Another time they, they might have been a famous historian or writer. And um, so, uh, again, it's sort of seeing something different every day, every time. Mm. Uh, I have to admit the time now is a little more challenging for a retail business, to say the oh, least. Sure. But, you know, we, we're determined to get through all of this. Uh, but we still go out to high. I was just up in Stowe, Vermont uh, last week, bought 4,000 books. Wow. Uh, just before we went on to tape this, I got a call from Provincetown. Someone sounds like they have an interesting collection. So in a few days, I'm going to drive down to Provincetown. That's sort of what I do day to day. And my wife says, you know, I only work half a day, 12 hours. <laughs> and I get in early in the morning. I work the day. And when I do talks like I'm going to do at the library, uh, it's even a little bit longer. But it's fun to talk to people about books. It's fun to see them, to see what their questions are, see what they have to be interested in. And then, you know, and then maybe 10 years from now, they remember us and they have an estate and they call and and that just keeps going on and on. And uh, it's, like I say, I'm very fortunate because I like what I do. It's a lot of fun. And, and you meet a lot of interesting people. Ken, it's certainly fascinating. I'm sure we could continue this for a long time, but people have to join us for the conversation uh, in the program we're doing together. And you and I will have to continue this conversation. I'm sure we can just, yeah, this is great. Obviously, it's what we both uh, really love and get so much out of our lives from. So thank you, you so love- much. And thank you for sharing. It's great to be able to take this love and be able to share it with the world. I'm really glad well, thank that you, you found a way to do it. And if anyone can't make it, go to our website, brattlebookshop.com. You can call, talk, uh, send pictures, emails. One of the problems I tell people is when you ask somebody who loves what they're doing a question, the problem isn't getting an answer. It's getting them to stop answering. <laughs> In any case, I look forward to doing the Zoom presentation at the library. Well, I'm certainly looking forward to it, too. Thank you so much, Ken. Thank you. So I hope you've enjoyed my conversation just now with Ken Gloss from the uh, Brattle Bookshop in downtown Crossing in Boston. He will be presenting here online on no- Tuesday, November 10th at 7 o'clock for the Rare Books Antiques Roadshow. He'll talk some, and we are encouraging you to bring any old books that you'd like to have him appraise, and we'll do our best in these remote times to do that. 